here. Uh, and what better place? I'm going to think he's saying it's being recorded. Fantastic. I'm consenting. Um, what better place to show off uh, the Museum of Futures than with a bunch of speculative designers? Um, Claire and I are really excited to show you around the, the Museum of Futures tonight. But first, I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respect to the traditional owners and their elders past, present and emerging upon whose ancestral land I am currently. Um, that is the Darug land here in Kalara in Sydney. And also, I guess, to acknowledge the tr traditional lands from where you're all beaming in from. And I can see uh, a few familiar faces and I, it looks like there's a, I imagine I've heard there's someone from the Blue Mountains. I know Sam, you're in the south part of Sydney. There's a diverse array of locations tonight, I imagine. So I guess that's one silver lining of the pandemic. Um, good to see lots of familiar faces and it's, yeah, it's Zoom. I guess we've all spent a lot of time on Zoom. It's, it's a bit like the Brady Bunch meets Play School. And speaking of play school, um, I'm happy to announce that Claire and I are conveniently located away from our children. So fortunately, um, we won't be being Zoom bombed by our children tonight, which is, which is a, another silver lining. Um, and so tonight it's just us. And tonight you'll get a chance to actually go on a tour in the futures. Um, there's, there's actually loads we could say about why it's, in, it's so important to think about futures and talk about the, the processes and theories that inform the creation of futures. And, and actually, we'd, we'd love to hear any of those type of questions from you that you have about you know, exactly those kind of topics. Um, and that's why we're going to make sure that we have a lot of time at the end um, to have a discussion and, and answer questions after the tour. And our plan initially, as I said, is to actually let you experience the museum first. And just before we do that, I might just explain what is the Museum of Futures. In a nutshell, it's an interactive exhibition that highlights the role that we all play in creating futures. So for that reason, um, along with the museum tour, we're, we're also going to give do a quick futuring exercise and actually give you a chance to contribute to the museum, which is exciting. So as I said, we'd love to hear all your questions. Um, so please, you know, collect them up as we go along. Um, I'm now actually going to stop my video. And in a second, I'm going to share my screen and we're, we're going to jump in and actually we're going to be in a virtual tour. So in the lead up to that, um, as much as it's nice seeing lots of faces there, I'm suggesting it might be useful if everyone stops sharing their video just for this part. So let's all do that now and just pop our videos off. There we go. And I am going to share my screen and we will get started in just a second. All right should now all see my theme. Is that looking? Great. Great. Thumbs up. Looking good, Claire. Okay, so uh, without any further ado, I'd like to hand over to tonight's tour guide, Claire Marshall. Thank you, Mel. Well, welcome everyone to the Museum of Futures. Now, I know first off the bat, that sounds a little bit like a paradox, and it totally is. But just as it's important for us to remember the past with traditional museums so that we can learn from it, it's also important for us to imagine the future so that we can build it. At the moment, we live in a world where most of us rarely think about the future. I know, especially if you've got you newer know, children, you just don't have time. Um, and another reason that we don't kind of think about the future very much is because it's really hard to imagine things that don't exist yet. It's even harder when we come to understand that not only is the landscape of the future different to what we experience today, but also that we will be different in the future. How we think will be different, what we value will be different, even how we define ourselves will be different. So with so much uncertainty when it comes to thinking about the future, what my research has kind of led me to think is that the best thing we can do is play. Play allows us to not mind if we get things right or wrong. It allows us to experiment, to try, and to perhaps be a little mischievous and a little irreverent. So let me invite you to play with us for the next little while in the Museum of Futures. So let's move now to 2050. Okay. Welcome to the Museum of Futures. We are so excited to have you all here to view the Future of Work exhibition. We have just a few rules before we get into the tour. If you are joining us from 20, 30 or later and you're using an avatar, please make sure that your avatar is 
fully clothed and appropriate for general viewing. Very important because we don't know whether we have young people here. If you are joining us from earlier than 2030, please be patient with the technology because we understand that your computing power is, is not quite advanced enough, but we should be able to make it work. So this exhibition is divided into two sections uh, representing the actions taken and the actions that were possible back in 2020. If you are visiting us from before 2050, it will be up to you to decide which one becomes our future. So we're going to start on the left hand side um, with our air quality in smokes. Now, I'm, in fact, I'm kind of going to skip over this one a little bit because this exhibition, this part of the exhibition was in fact created in 2018. But seeing that we tonight seem to have a lot of you from 2020 and wearing masks is kind of normal for you now, um, I think we'll just kind of skip ahead. So yeah, not too futury. Okay, so the next one we've got is the creation of Australia's Space Waste Agency. And this is one of my favorite pieces in this museum. So I'm not sure if you guys from 2020 know, but like WA is its own country now. Yeah, like big news, right? So rumor has it that this was because of the great waste shower of 2037. Uh, okay, let me back up a little bit. So what we see before us is some protective headwear from the Australian Space Waste Agency. So like everybody knows that China stopped taking our recycling and then the government was forced to follow America and set up a whole department to shoot our waste into space. Well, in 2037, one of those pods didn't quite hit its orbit and yep, it came down in WA. There was waste everywhere. There was like damage to buildings, like the whole Swan River was just like covered in junk and like the people from WA were really not happy. So yeah, decided to become their own country. Kind of funny. Okay, so the next one we're going to have a look at is kind of a little bit creepy. It's the rise of the Carpe Diem worker. So um, air quality in the CBD got really bad. So city workers, and there was lots of different reasons for this, like, but a big one was because the waste crisis kind of happened and people started burning rubbish and companies started incinerating their own rubbish. So basically, if you worked in the city, you had to have this chip implanted in your neck and sign a contract that basically said that you couldn't sue the company if you died early. There was like mass unemployment at this time, so everyone did it. And what was kind of weird was that this group came out of that called the Carpe Diem workers. And these were kind of workers who just went, well, you know what, we're going to live large and die young. And they blew all their money on doing crazy things like burning expensive clothes and like buying cars and crashing them. It was, it was pretty crazy, pretty crazy time. All right. And then the last one I want to just kind of chat to you guys about is this impounded solar panel. I know that might seem kind of strange for you guys if you're coming from a different reality, but the government back in 2020 bet on coal hard and it was a super disaster. People just went, well, like, we don't want to burn coal, so we're just going to get our own solar power. And the government got pretty angry. And so they decided that all solar panels were going to be banned. And if the police caught you with one, they would whack this sticker on and basically impound them until they could remove it. So um, that's the dark side of this exhibition. And I thought maybe we can just like stop for a moment here and think about what the world could be like if this was to happen. And then we're going to move on to the other side. Okay. So on the positive side of the room, we're going to start with the birth of living buildings. So this is quite a funny one. This is from quite a while ago now, back in 2021. So in the olden days, buildings used heaps of energy and they didn't generate any of their own. I know that's pretty weird, right? Anyway, this trophy was awarded to the first building that actually generated more energy than it used. They were the, also the first building to effectively use night soil. And I'm totally going to leave you guys to look up what that is. Okay, next one is the cavies. 
So, um, so this is quite an old model of a cabby or communal autonomous vehicle. These ones were first introduced back in 2025. Um, before then, I know it's pretty hard to believe, but people actually had their own cars. Like every household had a car. I have no idea like where they put all the cars, but they had cars. Anyway, these cabbies became popular and these cabbies would take people to the transport hubs when they would then go and take um, mass transport into wherever they needed to go. There were library cabbies, there were grocery store cabbies and even like Mormon cabbies. So like you had to be quite careful which one you got into because otherwise, you know, it might not be such a fun journey. Okay, the next one we're going to kind of have a look at is from waste to valuable resources. Um, and this one is kind of cool. Does anyone remember glasses? Yeah. So they, if you don't remember, these were like these things that you wore on your face to help your eyesight. And I know it seems really strange now, but back in 2020, there was this company that made them out of recycled um, bottle caps and like milk bottle tops. Um, they also developed this really cool tech where they could scan your plastic that you would bring into these micro factories. And then you could plug into a 3D printer what you wanted to turn your waste plastic into. I have so much weird jewelry that I don't wear anymore from doing that. So yeah, hot tip for you guys. Okay, uh, the next one we're gonna have a quick look at is Australia's second gold rush. So I'm just gonna go over this one quickly because you know we all know about Australia becoming like the world's leading global solar power. Um, and this is just quite funny. I'm not sure if you guys, like any of you know, but the government came up with this slogan, like we bottle sunshine. And what was kind of hilarious about this was that the craft beer industry jumped on board and kind of was like, we bottle sunshine and we also bottle beer. And it became this like crazy, funny tourist thing for people coming over to Australia to get some sunshine and also some great beer. Okay, and then the last one that I want to show you um, in our little whistle stop tour of the museum is the dawn of the regenerative generation. And I really like this one because it shows the power of a good story. So everyone knows Doodle Cat the Kids book, right? Well, um, what you might not know is that way back in 2022, the authors wrote this book, Doodle Cat Plants a Tree, and it got included in the baby bundle, which was this like, like bundle that was given to mothers as soon as they had babies. And the unexpected consequence was that there was this whole generation of kids that really grew up understanding the importance of rewilding. And that kind of led to this huge halting of our massive biodiversity loss. So this was a really, really powerful uh, book. So that's it for our little whistle stop tour. I hope you guys all enjoyed experiencing the Museum of Futures. That was very cool. So we now have a little exercise for everybody to do. We do, and I'm just gonna un I'm just switch this off here. And uh, yes, we do. We're gonna pop some things into the chat. And this is your chance to actually, um, well, as we said, a futuring exercise. Um, and just get my, so what we're going to do first, first step, do it, we'll do it bit by bit so we kind of don't um, give away, give the game away. First thing we want you to do is to do this quite quickly. Just grab an object around you, pick something random. Um, and, you, and if you don't have anything that you, you could draw something. Um, just do something, decide on it quickly. We'll give you about 15 seconds to do that. All right, I'm back again. All right, has everyone got an object? Give me a thumbs up when, you can, when you're all, all good. And I guess people can put their videos back on now so we can all see you. And Oh, wow. Oh, and I'm going to, um, I think I'm sharing my screen still, aren't I? So stop doing that. 
All right. So the next thing, the next step, if you could everyone take a photo of this object or doodle um, and do that against a, a plain background. So just find somewhere yeah. to. All right, how are we all going? Everyone photographed? Terrific, thumbs up. Right, next step, what we're gonna do is get ready to email this to us. There's the email address too. Uh, but don't email it yet. Um, yeah, get ready to, sorry. <laughs> get ready to send it. We have a few more new attendees just joined if you want to quickly repeat the instructions. Yeah, great. I'll send the whole lot. All right. That's the subject. All right. And here's the big reveal. I'll put all five things in one go. So you've got everything in one go. The five steps. Um, so last thing is if you could write three lines to describe how this object could be viewed by people in 2050. And with this one, we want you to think about how people in 2050 might be different. So is this object a historical artifact in 2050? Or is it ubiquitous and prolific in this world? Uh, is it something that the people from 2050 can't believe we ever used or something that they judge us for using now? Um, how would they think about this object that you you what do we say three or four minutes to do that yes short and sharp And there we go, there's the instructions again in a more readable format for you all. <laughs> and when you're ready, just put your first name at the bottom if it's not clear from your email address and send it to us. And what we're going to be doing with these is inside our Museum of Futures, and we can't really show it to you yet because it's still <laughs> being built. The, we've got an anti-chamber room, which is going to be full of everybody's ideas for the future. So we're gonna be able to go and see what a whole lot of different people think might be different in the future. I'm getting so I'm going to resist the temptation to read them. And we will send you guys a, through Tina, a image of uh, them all in the gallery um, uh, when it's in. So it should be, shouldn't be too long, a couple of days. Yeah, so there actually is, there's a space ready for this in, in, that, that room we're in there, the future of work room, there's another little spot just off to the edge, off to the side there that is, is ready for your work to go in. Hmm. And we will also send out to you guys if you would like to come. So the future of work is just one of, uh, one exhibition for the Museum of Futures. We actually have three in the works at the moment. Um, and the second one, Pandemic Pivots, is launching on the 5th of November in the evening. So we will send you guys an invitation if you would like to come along. This one is, um, I have to admit, like we're pretty proud and a bit excited about it. We have 10 amazing uh, communities that have come up with ideas for the future. Then these ideas have been translated by 10 artists into works of art with futures written for them. Uh, and we're going to be sharing them all with you guys. So, uh, yeah, can't wait.
So I've popped a link to it, uh, some details in the in the chat there. So if you go to that link, um, museumoffutures.com forward slash pandemic pivots, you'll see that there's a, um, a way to sign up, um, you know, so that you'll know, you'll be, you, you'll then get details of um, when, you know, when the, when we sing the RSVPs for this. Um, and yeah, as, as Claire said, we'll, we'll, we, now that you've come along to this, we're definitely going to make sure that you've got details sent out. Yeah, we're really excited about it. Cool, thank you. That was such a cool snapshot of the tour. I kind of wish I could see more of it. Um, <laughs> that was really cool. Um, so, um, are there anything else, um, Mel and, oh, we got a question. Will the exhibition be virtual as well? Uh, yes, and physical, but um, as I'm sure everyone can understand, it's a bit weird at the moment. <laughs> So we're, we're kind of struggling of like uh, whether to make an investment in the physical exhibition. So everything's going to be virtual until things look a bit more set. Cool. Thank you, Mel and Claire. That was really lovely. Um, yeah, I've, I've followed um, your work on LinkedIn for a while when you guys posted. I was like, oh, I wonder where this is going to be. Um, quite surprised of how it like evolved to and actually made it virtual. I think that was a wonderful effort so now we're going into our q a section um you're welcome to ask your question directly to our um guest today um there's a reaction button on the right hand corner if you just want to put your hand up um or just put an emoji up you can um definitely go forward and ask the question if you prefer to um, write your question directly in the chat as well that will work um but i'll open up uh, Q&A for everyone now. Oh, I can also start. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the process and how the idea of Museum Futures came about? Because I know this is not the first version you guys have done the work. Yeah, so it was kind of, <laughs> it was kind of interesting actually. So the city of Sydney uh, commissioned this one actually, The Future of Work was, is the first one. Um, they were, they have a national city switch program which is encouraging buildings to make changes um, towards sustainability and they wanted something interesting, well actually the words they used was, we want something cool, you do cool things Claire, come and have a meeting. And in that meeting the idea for Museum of Futures was born. I thought I was quite like ingenious coming up with this idea until I did some research months later and realized that there's been lots of different incantations of speculative design objects. Um, and so I think the interest in the museum now is kind of turned a little bit to really try to um, make those futures be other people's ideas for the future. So that it ends up being this beautiful exhibition of all different people's ideas for the future, not just us as designers. Yeah, I think that's a really strong aspect of what this is about. It's actually a participatory process. So it's helping to democratise futures so that people, like a lot of the people that we dealt with in the communities for this Pandemic Pivots exhibition were like, futures, what's that? But, oh, you want me to think about how I want the world to be? Ah, I get it. And they, oh, I can be part of that. And it's about making it accessible rather than it, being some sort of exercise that um, where someone's being clever. I mean, I, I love um, speculative design pieces, but I think things that can actually be go beyond just being clever and actually enabling people to be part of a process. That's what really excites me. That's what I, I, I'm thrilled that you know, so Claire actually came up. This is this exhibition, the exhibition you just saw, um, the, the future of work is something that she put together pretty much on her own. And it's an extraordinary amount of, well, with a team, a team of people, but it was really, it's her baby. And um, I'm, I'm thrilled that she's asked me to kind of work with her on subsequent things that we've now rolling out the pandemic pivots um, with the support of City of Sydney as well. Uh, City, of, City, of Sydney, uh, City of Sydney. Um, so, yeah. Any other questions about the exhibition we've just been to, um, about the practices? Is it a VR one as well? If I had goggles, would you be able to walk around? 
you know what? That's a really good question. <laughs> and I have, we haven't explored it because we were actually telling Tina before in the process of doing this, like we went through so many different platforms and there's some where VR is available. This one's got a really cool augmented reality layer where you can actually put QR codes in the physical and then link it to bits of the virtual, but I'm not sure about VR actually, but it would be cool. But yeah, I don't know. Cause yeah. then you could have the 3d models. Well, you can do 3d models in this. Huh? The, and actually, can I just say if anyone's got like a, uh, uh, a link I've already asked Sam but like I'm trying to find um people who've got a uh, good 3d scanners to scan the objects that we've got for the museum we can get one or two done because people have um connections but yeah I'd love to get all of them done because wouldn't it be amazing having them in 3d Anyone's got any links? Yeah, um, I'm quite interested to hear about um, the, because you guys had a, um, a call out for artists to collaborate. Could you walk us through what was that process like? You know, who, who did you engage with? Um, you know, the setup of it, we'd be very keen to hear more about that. Mel, do you want to go or should I take it? Yeah, sure, happy, happy to. Well, um, that was a, um, in, so Tina, just to check, you're, you're interested in the process of how we found artists or the process of bringing them on board? I can talk to both of those points. Yeah. Okay. Well, this was actually a really exciting part of this process. A, a lot of work was involved in it, um, but it was a really super amazing process to, um, to go out to the community. First of all, we had to get clear on what, what is it that we want people to do. And we came up with a, um, I guess, a, an artist brief and, we then started just reaching out to everyone we knew who knew artists and, and actually we've, we've, we've managed to find, unearth this extraordinary collection of people. Like some people are very established artists and we've got people who are just starting out. We've, it's a really interesting array of, of people who are involved and they're, I mean, they've all come up with incredible things. Um, and, and part of what we've wanted to do as well is have these artists to um, demonstrate the process that they're going through and to give the community that they've worked with a flavor of what they've come up with along the way over over a month long period so every week they're kind of um giving an update on where they've, where they've come where, where they're at so so in terms of how we found the artists i mean i guess we just did a call out and we had we had um claire came up with the idea of of getting people to put in an expression of interest so people filled the artist filled in an expression of interest then we did a shortlisting process um, which we, we had um, lucky to have, have um, Fenella Kernaburn from TEDx, the curator of TEDx Sydney, and also um, Deb, oh goodness. Woman from UNSW. Yes, and so they, they were our, um, uh, worked with us. We had, we had, we had a basically a, a process where we went through and um, shortlisted and um, uh, Claire, what else would you add in terms of that process? One of the things that was really important to us was we, we, we wanted the artists to be reflective of the communities. So we had uh, different themes. So we, like, for example, we had one of our themes was um, people with a disability. So we have an artist with a disability who has produced the most incredible work. I cannot wait for everybody to see it. It's mm. absolutely stunning. Um, so we, we tried to kind of match artists with communities or pull artists from those communities. And then it was important for, oh, have I frozen? Sorry. Um, and then it was important for us to have the artists not only to show their process out of interest for us and how it goes, but to keep the communities updated because um, there's something about uh, an artist taking your ideas and turning them into something that makes your ideas feel more powerful and special and kind of is, is, is empowering for the community. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was great. We, we ha had way more people apply than we, we thought, which was exciting. And we're also uh, open to if anyone here as, you know, interested in speculative design wants to be part of a future exhibition, please let us know. Um, because yeah, we're always going to be looking for mm. artists and especially artists who've got an interest in, in, certain things so yeah mm. hit us up what are the topics or skills you're looking to cover or like what kind of work you're looking to produce in this like next call out mm. well i don't know 
I've, I've got my eye on doing something around human rights, but I feel like the next one is probably going to be very, I mean, they're all climate focused <laughs> because I've, I've, I wish maybe I'll try and find it for you, but there's a great William Gibson quote, which basically just says any discussion of the future that doesn't address climate change is nearsighted and ridiculous. Oh, I've got it here. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I'll put it up. I'll put okay. it in the chat. Um, so look, all of them talk about climate change because I don't, yeah, I just, I think that they're so interlinked now that um, it's difficult not to, but um, yeah, we, I think we'll probably be doing something with WWF around uh, biodiversity loss, climate, uh, animals and stuff. But yeah, human rights is on my agenda too. Um, I would love to do something around like bias in AI, um, access data, informed consent i don't know all of those things are yeah kind of so if anyone's got a keen interest in that hit me up and and maybe we can like push it over the line together yeah we, uh, as cliff said very keen to have people come on board if you've got if you've got ideas because this is really about um well like having also having be able to work with a community was very interesting like uh the, the process, I think the pandemic presented an opportunity, if, if that's the way to look at it, to have you know, people who would not, not ordinarily be able to speak to each other and um, have an opportunity where people, you know, artists who potentially didn't have, you know, had lost income, for them to actually talk, you know, do the, show their work, to earn some, some uh, money during this process and to actually be part of trying to envisage a new future. So, um, and as Claire says, it, there's all manner of different ways, uh, particularly around the climate um, topic. That's something that's definitely something we want to, we want to focus on. Any other questions from the room? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Um, so, hi, I'm Ziff, by the way. Um, now, now, actually, you mentioned a little bit about participatory, um, or, or this exercise sort of like having some kind of like particip participatory potential. Um, I'm keen to understand how you mean by that and whether, because like everything that we're seeing so far is kind of like a provocative, right? Or like it gets you thinking. Um, but I'm, I'm imagining like, what's next or what does that sort of lead to and uh when you when you're talking about um having a participatory aspect to that um does that manifest in a sort of like conversation or does it become like an actual project or mm. uh, how, how do you see this coming together well I'll, I'll i'm sure claire will have something to say about this as well but just to answer your point so i think to so the next exhibition that we're about to launch um which you, isn't quite ready to show you yet. It was kind of just in one of the little ante rooms behind, it's just being built. But that is actually a very participatory thing. It's the Pandemic Pivots exhibition. And it's participatory in the sense that um, the artists who are like literally have just finished making these objects over a period of um, a couple of months in conversation with communities. So they're, they're, in, a, they're in a process, of, it's, a, there's a, uh, you know, it's in that way, the communities are actually getting to say this is the futures that we want and they're kind of having an ongoing dialogue with, with, between the communities and the artists. So that's one way for it to be participatory. Because um, I agree with you that there's things that are provocative. That, that, that's something I would like to go beyond, just this idea that, um, that speculative design is something where people do, oh, something really clever and isn't that amazing and it gets you to see the world in a different way. But actually, how does it let other people become part of that process and be part of... Um, having a voice about how the future is going to be. So, so, so pandemic pivots is, is our aim is for it to be participatory in that sense, but there's a whole lot of other ways that you can make things participatory. And Claire, what more would you say about that? Uh, <laughs> I could say so much. And I can actually probably, I can send you a paper probably by the end of the year that I'm working on, which is breaking up experiential futures in speculative design by Telos. So by like, um, like idea behind it rather than execution into provocation or prototype. So yeah. are we asking people to just think differently or are we saying, here's some ideas, play with them and see what you can make out of. At the moment, this is at the beginning of the journey and obviously, um, but the Museum of Futures will get more participatory as it goes. So 
Mm. We're starting with the gallery, like even with you guys being able to do your own thing today, that's going to end up becoming part of it. There's also the part of it of we're trying to extend the world of Museum of Futures out so that it becomes a bit more playful so that you will kind of receive uh, like ideas and little snippets of the future to where you are across different mediums. Because we were talking about before how everybody is like, you know, we're all doing different things at once. We're on Zoom and we're also... So how can you kind of play with that as a world where people get bits of the Museum of Futures from different platforms? Is there like a cheeky Twitter account? Is there this? And then those kind of things will be much more participatory because the narrative will change based on the involvement from the audience. Cool, thanks. All right. Any other questions from the room? I do have another one. So Claire, when you were sort of driving the, driving the museum and showing us the museum, I can, well, correct me if I'm wrong. You took a very story, storytelling approach to kind of, you know, we are at, you know, we're at 2050, we're at 2030. Can you give us a bit of insight of how you came to put those stories together and why you chose to use a storytelling way to walk us through the exhibition? Ah, yes. Okay. So, so this is, this is a big part of my research. So, um, I'm really interested in how narratives change our understanding of things. So if you, if you, if you think about it, we understand the world a lot through stories, through stories we are told about how things work. So money is a story. Democracy is a story. These are all kind of uh, narratives that we kind of um, believe in that is is how the world works. When those narratives change, our whole understanding of the rules that the, the world is, is based on change. So I think for me, taking a storytelling approach was both, um, it's, it's simple, like it kind of, um, it speaks to people through, uh, like our holistic kind of information processing system as opposed to our analytical information system processing. Does everyone know about this? Like, am I, no? Should I continue? Okay. So um, we have two ways which we uh, process information. We have analytically and then kind of with our body and emotionally. Um, and the interesting thing for my research that has kind of found is that when it comes to looking at like existential threats like climate change or, um, you know, the perils of AI or whatever, is that um, analytical, focusing on the analytical information processing system through reports and things like that, we kind of like ingest it and then we go, Ugh! whereas if we give something where people can have an emotional reaction, we kind of, we, we tap into that holistic way of information processing. And the cool thing is emotions hijack our analytical information processing system. So by giving you a story or an emotion, I can then give you some facts and it, the theory is at least that you will uh, prioritize that information better. So, um, so yeah, so hence storytelling. The other thing about storytelling is that like, um, it is through stories that we kind of, um, we kind of come to understand what actions to take, what's normal, um, how we define ourselves. Do we define ourselves with that story or against that story? So um, yeah, hence the stories. And, and if you notice, I hope everyone knows, I did it, I did it, it was quite short this one, admittedly. You can actually go back and um, listen to each item has a full description and an audio tour. Um, there's, there's facts and there's structure in there that, that, that is uh, kind of modeled. And then there's always the crazy unintended consequence. So um, one of the ones, I think it was in the mask one, we kind of, I was talking to the city of Sydney and we kind of went so far as going, well, if people can't go outside, they can't do sport because they have to wear a mask all the time. Maybe Australia is not a great sporting nation anymore. Like maybe our last like Olympic medal was in like rhythmic gymnastics, which everyone is like mm, about. So um, kind of trying to add in like those, funny and irreverent unintended consequences.
Thank you. That was great. Um, any other? I was going to say, how would it be possible if we listen to one of those audio snippets? Yeah. Um, vision, because I noticed there was like a little audio underneath. I was hoping to, you know, get a sense of. <laughs> In fact, every single one of them has an audio. Yeah. Every one of them. No. So pick. What should we do? I'll share my screen, and you know, I'll just need to. We'll do it by my screen, Claire. Do you want to? Yeah. Why don't you all vote on which one you want you want me to to do? Well, I'll just just give me a second while I fire up the a new a new tab here. Well, meanwhile, this is happening. Um, what what filtering has everyone been up to in you know in the past like six or eight months in this really strange time? I've been thinking about tomorrow. That's probably mm, I, that's a good question. I've been getting really getting into participatory futures. That's my thing that I'm really interested in. I think there's maybe we can share something quite interesting that we sort of discovered with um, with the pandemic pivots project was that um, initially we had we really wanted to run some of our community engagement through social media because we thought it would be great for people to see each other's ideas for the future and kind of build on them and be able to kind of like and comment and, and everything like that. And these were in like fairly safe groups with fairly like tight communities. So we weren't really worried about trolling and we thought that would be kind of um, fun. But in a pandemic, like the future is really political and it was really interesting because we sort of um, didn't get a great response on social media and then we decided to switch to doing uh surveys where people could kind of just send it straight into us and and then we got lots of response so i think it's been really interesting to see that it's you know thinking about the future now is different from thinking about the future even a year ago in, in my experience Okay. All right, I'm I'm ready when you are. If we want to pick. Um, I can actually go and I've got the list of works here. Does anyone anyone in particular that people want to go for? Feel free to type it in the chat or speak out. You can like vote it. or yeah. Less cars. All right, the cavy. Ready. Da da da. -da. This object is a scale model of what's known as a Communal Autonomous Vehicle, or CAVI. CAVIs were introduced into Australian cities in 2025, but became widespread by the end of the decade. Communal share bikes, scooters and skateboards helped residents get to the end of their street, where CAVIs then provided a transport solution to the local transport hub. At a hub, residents could then access buses, high-speed trains and even light aircraft. As residents began to eschew personal vehicle ownership, many residential roads around the city were repurposed as green corridors or urban farming projects. While cabbies provided bridging transport between streets and local transport hubs, they also unexpectedly fostered community relations. Many cabbies became a place for residents to catch up or borrow a book from the cabbie library, or for students to work on their studies during their commute. On an interesting note, the word cavo became popular during the late 2020s as a way of describing someone who lived near you and with whom you were friendly. Prominent language researchers say that cavo is a synonym for the word neighbour, but others have argued that the word described an entirely new and organic relationship between people, which more accurately translated to community friend. Someone also voted for Space Waste Agency. Do we have time for one more? Yeah, let's do that one. Great idea. Okay. This, the communal autonomous vehicle was, <laughs> I got really obsessed with kind of thinking about it. And I did a, a greenhouse session event where we were focused on transport. And I actually wrote a stand-up comedy set that thank goodness I didn't perform, a stand-up comedian did. 
uh, that was all about hilarious. Mystery. This object yeah, in the cabbie. So. <laughs> Getting in the brief right. one versus. <laughs> All right, here we go. Space waste. This object is an example of specialised protective headwear used by the Australian Space Waste Agency, which was established in 2035. After China's 2017 embargo on Australia's recycling waste, and due to reports that recycling materials were being dumped into landfill, people became sceptical and eventually stopped sorting waste altogether. Even when businesses attempted to reintroduce their own waste management strategies, residents and tenants were reluctant to put in the effort. In 2035, things reached a crisis point and the government was forced to follow the lead of the United States by shooting waste pods into space. However, things did not run smoothly for the Australian Space Waste Program. In 2037, a malfunction in the waste cannon meant that the waste pods did not reach an orbiting altitude and as a result returned to Earth, hitting the city of Perth. This event, known as the Waste Shower of 2037, involved over 300 fatalities and 50 damage, as people and property were struck by errant household objects. This event was also largely attributed to inflaming tensions between WA and the rest of Australia, and resulted in Western Australia deciding to secede and gaining sovereignty in 2038. I think Claire's from Western Australia as well, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> to be like, I love it. I was always um, really charmed by the fact that the, the only reason it took so long for Australia to actually federate was that WA was like, no, nah, no, nah, no, we don't, no, we don't really want to. And even Lang Hancock, which was a big magnate, mining magnate, um, he had these plans to off WA so um, a, lo a lot of these uh, a lot of these stories and this is kind of um, something that is I, I do a lot in my work and and I always find really interesting is that most of them are based on the, the inklings of things that are true they're just kind of taken to I don't know maybe illogical or, or maybe like slightly exaggerated you know um, possibilities well thing I felt great for um, put another quote in there but I'll read it to you anybody who is surprised by what we're going through right now hasn't been paying attention to what scientists have been telling us for over 30 years so yeah a lot of these things like the idea that um, uh, something like for everyone's wearing face masks like that that was um, seemed really way out maybe two years ago. And in fact, I remember the day when Claire actually had to go and get one of those face masks and use it for her son. So yeah. like, yeah, there's so many things that we think, oh, that's never gonna happen. And in fact, well, the idea, oh, a pandemic that stops planes flying, that's never gonna happen. Well, it has. And these, these things, you know, that's, I guess, in, from you who have, I guess a lot of you probably would know this, but uh, like scientists and, and Foresight practitioners have been saying this for ages. Like the pandemic, this pandemic is not. It's not a black swan. It's not a black swan. It's not a. It's not some out of out of the world out of this world thing. It's it's not. It's a if not but when situation, and it's just that we, it's just that we didn't. It's almost that we weren't didn't have the imagination to mm -hmm. to think that this could happen, and and that's the. I think that's what this this kind of work gives people the possibility to actually kind of really lean in and experience the possibility that this could happen. Like by, by listening to that and someone just said, it's really sobering. Like, yeah, gee, maybe that could happen. That things got so bad that Western Australia has leaves because, you know, this really cataclysmic thing happens. Yeah. And I think that this is probably my call to arms to anyone who is in this field is yeah. that, I went to a conference, uh, the Global Foresight Summit, and people who were much more experienced in foresight than me were talking about the problem of, is it a problem that decision makers don't listen to futurists or a problem the futurists don't 
persuade decision makers enough. And I think that part of that is that they're missing artists in that persuasion. There is a great skill that artists have in taking things that we think or glimpses of things and turning them into stuff that like affects us emotionally and, and changes our minds and our hearts. And I think that like we all have a responsibility to kind of use the skills that we have to, to get people to think more coherently and, and, and more seriously mm. about the future. Yeah. And actually I think what you said ties back to what you said before, Claire, about the power of narrative um, that's that's where art can play a part but also I think uh, that this kind of work can actually allow people to drop into the really deep drivers rather than just the surface level stuff it's actually what are the deep metaphors that are that are driving like kind of structural behavior um, at, a, at a personal level but also at a societal level and and I think that this is a place where real much more kind of real change can happen like change that that can happen that's lasting and that um, that's a change that translates into something real rather than just a surface level change. I would be keen to hear everyone's thought about that. My immediate thought about, um, you know, I, I, I strongly believe in foresight and speculative design from a, from a risk aversion and making better decision perspective, but I, from a, you know, being in strategic field and being in very close to like the, decision being made and implementation perspective, I think the biggest challenge lies not so much about futures and foresight, not a foresight practitioner is not being persuasive. I think it often has a lot to tie into, well, we're looking to implement and make decisions that need to happen now. And often um, foresight practitioners, even myself who are looking to, you know, speculate and, um, have a conversation about those things. The timeline just doesn't allow you to do that. The research that needs to be done to be able to convey the deep message that often may take a lot more time to produce for people who have that immersive experience, I think. Yeah. And then I would also throw it in like, how might it work from a, from a, project planning and monetary perspective, like involving artists in the getting things lined up. If you're only working, you know, you're like 10 weeks to do this thing, like your client's asking you to deliver this thing, not to the sort of materiality level, but actually just need to make strategic decisions and implementation plans. You kind of don't always have that leeway, but that's my experience. I'll leave it up to Roman. And Damien, you put your hand up. Oh uh, yeah, hi. Um, really interesting talk. I was just wondering what your thoughts were. Well. Uh, Mel and Claire were talking about before about being persuasive and, um, you know, artists having this sort of place amongst uh, the planning of the future. And I've been exploring speculative design this year and I've kind of been wondering what's my role, what's my role in it as far as, as, as someone that practices it. And I've started to see it as more of a facilitator, not so much just about generating my own ideas, but facilitating. And I see that in what Claire and Mel have done, which is making it very participatory. And I just want to know what their thoughts were and anyone's thoughts actually on sort of our role. Uh, if we take on, you know, if we get it ourselves as future designers, what's, how would we define our role? Or maybe it's different from everyone. Mm. Oh, well, I've got lots I could say about that and probably Claire, you do as well. <laughs> you go now. Um, oh, Damien, it's a great question. Thank you for that. Um, great to see that you're exploring all of this. Uh, yeah. So uh, lots in, in your question there, but I guess to start off with, we'd all know about this, um, this whole notion of moving from doing design to people and, and there's designing for people and then designing with people and, you know, like that whole thing. And, you know, see things like co-design becoming really popular, which is wonderful. And I'm seeing that happening within the futures field as well, because I've kind of got a foot in both camps within futures and design. And in a sense, they have many overlapping things. Um, so yeah, the idea, I think also that this, I'd have to say that it opens up the idea of who's an artist as well. Like maybe we're all artists. Um, and the idea that somebody does an artwork or does a, um, some kind of uh, process where you come up with some clever idea, um, to provoke people's thinking, 
um, and present it instead of it being something that people have created together. I, I think we're, there's a lot of challenge to that now. Um, and I don't think it needs to be that you even need to do something like this, this process that I think Claire and I are in the, we're in the process of making this something that can happen where people can be part of it on an ongoing basis. It doesn't have to be that, you know, it's just, we have an artist and they do like, I, I, I think down the track, the Museum of Futures is, is going to grow to be something that is, um, like it's going to have many different manifestations. Like each exhibition that we've had is a different take on that. So, um, yeah, look, I think as well, like, there's just this, just a real groundswell to move away from the idea of um, someone like a, you know, a strategic foresight practitioner coming along and doing something for their client or, or telling, um, uh, telling people, oh, this is what we think is going to happen. It, it's just, it's just not useful anymore. It's not, I, I think processes that actually enable people, you know, it, it's almost like a grand scale exercise mm -hmm. in, in, um, in, in user research that, that, that foresight can help to facilitate in various different means. Can I say something really quick, Damien, which is yeah, um, please. You, you do what like is your special talent, I think, in this. And we, from, from my perspective, we need both provocation and prototyping. And, and we need prototyping because that's the co-design part. And we need provocation because sometimes there are ideas that take a long time to grow and yeah. people don't have them on their own. So they, they, they need... Uh, they need provocation to be able to even kind of go, oh my God, whoa, 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 that, that's a crazy idea and incorporate yeah. yeah, true. It's like getting ideas out there and then helping others come up with their own as well. Yeah. And I wanted to quickly say something to your point, Tina, which is the practicalities of it all. And, and to sort of say that, um, yes, sure, there's like, but there's always, um, we always see that there's, there's kind of time and money pressures, but that's a narrative of where to put resources. So I think that like potentially as the future becomes more uncertain and we start to see more crazy events, which we know are on the horizon because of climate change, like this, this you know, pandemic is like a zoonotic disease based on, you know, habitat loss and yada, yada, yada. That, that people might actually start going, you know what, we're not going to give them a week to come up with something. We're going to invest more time and energy into not only thinking through the, the vast possible alternative futures, but also thinking about the one that we want together and actually trying to take some agency within organisations to drive for the future that they want, rather than I think that quite a lot of the time we sort of, to, to use my, my academic, we buy into dominant narratives that don't suit us. So we buy into whether you want to go to like neoliberal capitalism or whatever. We buy into that narrative of this is what everybody is doing and this is how the world works. Well, that's not true. The world can work in, in lots of different ways, but we kind of need to steer our direction. And we've sort of seen that with the rise of B Corp companies and and lots of different companies that have kind of gone, well, actually, we believe in different things and we're going to focus on them. So. Sorry, a bit of a rant there. No, no. <laughs> uh, look, look, I, look, I could say off the back of that, but you, you, it's a great question you've asked, Damien. There's all manner of... Yeah, I'm just holding myself back from saying more. Cool. Love to hear more sometime, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that brings us to... 35. Um, are there any burning questions or comments that, you know, we want to um, share with the room or like, you know, let Claire and Mel know? Otherwise, um, just checking on the chat. So um, thank you, Claire, Mel. That was really, really. Hello. Yes. Hi. Please go, Dr. Ali. Uh, uh. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Can you hear us? Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Um, yes. yes. Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear us? Is it 
Is it me or uh, can you hear me? So, uh, okay, okay, I can continue. So first of all, let me express my deepest gratitude uh, to privilege of addressing this convention. This is my first time that met you guys because I've attended in lots of uh, future and foresight events. And this is my first time that I met the new uh, guys from Australia. It seems that you are, you're based in Australia. So since five years ago, we established the Asia Pacific Futures Network, but never seen you in this event uh, because it's annual uh, meeting. But uh, it is interesting because I finished my PhD in force and I future studies uh, in the Middle East. And now I'm working as a consultant for such of these uh, countries and such of these, uh, you know, research centers. But the interesting topic was that uh, one of you guys told me that uh, why the, the, the policymakers uh, cannot believe the future is. I thought it is in, in Middle East, but it seemed that in Australia you have the same problem. So, the, so it, it raised me some, uh, some notes that how we can uh, democratizing foresight in any part of the world. It seems that in Australia you have problem as a future is to, to democratize the, the results of the foresight project. So uh, the commitment and these things is important. And, uh, and, and I'm, uh, I'm happy that I can join you to Asia Pacific Futures Network because next month we have a very big venue in, from the Slaughter Group, from uh, Hawaii, from uh, I don't know any part of the world. Uh, this kind of like a professor of uh, future study and force that attended. So I can uh, invite you because I'm a regi regional editor of G uh, Journal of Future Studies. So and uh, I'm so lucky and happy to find you. So it seems that in the future uh, we can keep in touch for such these uh, good venues and I enjoyed your presentation. It's, it's a small group, but I enjoyed it a lot. It's so professional. And so, but, but uh, my question is, is how we can help it to the policy, to policy makers and to us as a future is to, to democratizing foresight and the results and the people also, how we can make this commitment for the people to believe us as a future is because some people say, okay, you are futurist, so you talk so fantasy things and this kind of things. <laughs> but uh, it seems that we have the same problem in all parts of the world. Uh, by the way, thank you for inviting me for such a good venue. And uh, it's, it's my pleasure to, to, to meet you. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Ali. And, and okay. your question, I think by, I think the way that we get decision makers to pay attention is by doing more participatory futures work because I think that um, yeah. a lot of our decision makers are elected and if more people are actively thinking about the future that they want then those decision makers are going to listen because that's really their job is to build the infrastructure for the future yeah. that we all want. So. Yeah, I actually think there's been, there's a, um, yeah, the yeah. pandemic has kind of provided the, the perfect opportunity for foresight to become, you know, people kind of go, oh, right, now I get it. And, and to your point about, I actually think the idea of um, foresight practitioners um, kind of coming along and doing foresight, like I, I, think, I think we need to get better at actually it, be, it becoming something that, like it's kind of got to be almost a capacity building process within a society so that people even get the notion that, there is more than one future, like there's any number of futures and we can all be part of shaping futures. And I can see people nodding their heads like, yeah, that's, that's the once at some level, almost at a societal level, if that we can get that message out sort of from that angle, we can kind of like triangulate, got to get society, people in society kind of, as Claire said, feeling like they can be part of um, making change. So therefore they're going to exert pressure on policymakers, but I think policymakers are getting it now. They, they kind of, they can see the strategic advantage in it just makes sense to actually to think ahead about these things. So anyway, I'm aware of time. Um, you were, you're were winding us up there, Tina. So maybe I should. Oh, stop. I was going to say, um, you guys already put um, your uh, website address on. Um, if anyone wants to contact you guys or connect with you guys, 
what's the best way is it through that address or is it an email address that people could connect? yeah or the email address that hello at museum of future will go to both of us so cool. yeah cool. yeah and we're both you know on linkedin but yeah send it send it through to hello at yeah that everyone got that one up there i'll copy it in again and i'll stop recording